Hi, my name is Eric Singleton. I'm curator of ethnology at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, and I'm going to be giving you a tour of the exhibition Spyro and the Art of the Mississippian World. What's really exceptional about this exhibition is it explores the pre-contact and pre-Columbian cultures of North America, most of which inhabited the eastern half of North America. Uh, and today, um, the descendants of many communities we know, the Cherokee, the Caddo, the Wichita-affiliated tribes, the Choctaw, the Seminole, they are descendants of the, pe the Mississippian people who created uh, most of the giant mounds and the communities that we're gonna be discussing in this exhibition. So as we move forward, we're gonna actually begin this tour with the Mississippian world. Now, the reason it's important to talk about the Mississippian world is because that's the context for the Spiroan people. Uh, the, the Spiro site in Oklahoma is one site that's connected to the larger Mississippian world. But the big question is, who are the Mississippians? And that's what we do in this space. So the Mississippians uh, created large ceremonial centers with uh, elites, so they had commoners, they had um, warriors, they had ritual leaders. The basic economics for the Mississippian uh, people actually centers on the harvesting of flora and fauna, with corn being the dominant crop. Uh, they also hunted small game, um, and then connecting all of the Mississippian people across the entire eastern half of North America was a shared belief system or a shared religion. And so a lot of the objects that you see in this space were connected to that shared religious belief. The first piece we talk about here, these are called long nose maskets. These would have been attached to a headdress. These are about the width of a piece of paper and they were made of copper. And these ear spools were about a thousand years old. So it speaks to the artistry of the Mississippian people. But how do we actually know what they did? And, and uh, how do we know what they look like and, and other aspects of their culture? Well, one of the ways is looking at European sources when contact was made in the 1500s. To do that, we highlight color engraved images from 1590. And these were done by Theodore de Bry. They were based off watercolors that were made in 1564 uh, by a gentleman named Lemoy in Florida. Others were made by John Smith in Roanoke in the 1580s. Now these are not entirely accurate, but they're very close. They show traditions, they show hunting scenes, they show medicine, they show worship, and they show the practice of tattooing people. All of these things we knew existed. Um, and so they give us some insights into who the Mississippians are. The other way we do this is by looking at archeology. span Archeology has allowed us to identify multiple Mississippian ceremonial centers. In this exhibition, we highlight five of those. The largest is called Cahokia. Cahokia is a uh, community just outside of present-day St. Louis, and it contained 220 mounds. Uh, and that's just one of the Mississippian centers in the eastern half of North America. Others include Etowah in Georgia, Kincaid in Illinois, Mound in Alabama, and Spyro in Oklahoma. Now in this space, in addition to seeing these text panels, you're going to see that there are objects displayed in casework. Each of these cases has objects related to a specific site. The one in front of you actually highlights Moundville, and you can see that it's a combination of ceramics and stone work. Most of the stone you see here has images incised in it. And these are images you're gonna see throughout the exhibition. They're gonna highlight underwater panthers. They're gonna highlight the human hand. 
um, and they're going to show you the same theme over and over and over again. Now, you'll see that the human hand is repeated in this case multiple, in multiple places. Religion and ideology talks about an above, a middle, and a below world. Now, the below world is not what we typically think of, and that it's a constant underworld. It's actually the night sky. And throughout the day, it flips. So the above world becomes, goes underneath, and the beneath world goes above. And that's where the hand and so much of this is connected to constellations in the night sky. In other instances, you're going to see human effigy forms. In this case, you have the form of a turtle. Next to it, you're going to see a ceramic. And the image on this ceramic, if you see that swirl pattern, is connected to the natural world. That is a moth proboscis, or a tongue. It's a moth tongue. And the sphinx moth has a tongue that stretches about 14 inches. Um, other instances, you see human forms, both male and female. Um, and just an exceptional array of artistic ability. And each of these pieces, it's important to remember, um, have importance. They're actually active. These things are not used in a utilitarian, re in a utilitarian way, which means uh, daily life. They're connected to something bigger. They're used in a very sacred and religious way. And so most of the items you see here are connected to that. Other instances you're going to see are pieces like this, which show the human form, but in a different way. For instance, you have these uh, head effigy pots. And if you look at the head effigy pots, uh, you see that there are tattoo markings on them. And those tattoo markings, you'll note, correspond to the earlier Debray engravings we talked about. So even though Debray did not see them in person or utilize some of them exactly, he got the concept there. You also note that um, these tattoo markings, there's no two are alike. They're each different. And so you would be led to think that each of these pieces represents a unique individual. And it's not the same form being done over and over and over again. Um, in addition to this, in addition to actually walking through the space, we have touchscreen elements that are going to have talking heads of academics related to each site. Those are about two minute videos. Then behind us, we have a timeline. And this timeline is complicated or is complemented by a map. This map actually shows the various ceremonial centers across North America and shows them in context to the Aztec and the Maya. But these actually put the sites that we're talking about in context to location throughout North America. But space is only one aspect of this. The other is time. So when you come in here, you're going to be able to hit a digital timeline just by simply hitting Explore. And it's going to show you uh, the Mississippian people on a, on a world stage, so in context with what's happening throughout the world. For instance, when the Mississippian world starts, they're creating algebra in Baghdad. When Cahokia, that large ceremonial center, is founded, William the Conqueror invades England in 1066. When Spyro and most of these ceremonial centers are at their height, Genghis Khan is invading China and moving throughout the world. When Spyro and many of these sites are actually collapsing or, or, or declining, uh, Joan of Arc is, uh, Joan of Arc is, uh, is uh, becoming a hero in Europe to some. Hmm. Uh, and then the one that really stands out in my mind is Harvard is founded in 1636, and the last Mississippian kingdom does not collapse or fold until 1650. 
So that means Harvard is teaching classes when the people and the Mississippians are actually still moving around the country. So that's the Mississippian world, and that is the introduction to this entire exhibition. So next we're going to move into the Spiro Room. So as you come around the corner, this entire space is dedicated to spiral mounds. Spiral mounds are located in the southeastern portion of, of Oklahoma in LaFleur County. Uh, spiro is the most unique site ever discovered in North America. And the big question for this exhibition is why? So what we found at Spiro is the most object-laden mound ever discovered in North America. What does that mean? There are more objects at Spyro than any other Mississippian site anywhere else in North America. 90% of all engraved shell comes from Spyro. So, once again, why Spyro? So, we start asking, why did all these pieces come here and when? Well, we realized they all came here at about 1400 AD. That's actually the same time that all of the Mississippian centers across North America are starting to decline. So what would make the entire eastern half of North America start declining? Well, the answer is environmental change. Similar to what we're going through today, where you have environmental upheavals, change in wind patterns, change in water patterns, they actually affect weather. And this led in about 1350 AD to a series of extensive droughts, which lasted 10 to 15 years. This occurred throughout the eastern half of North America, and it lasted until 1650. So when we talk about Roanoke and Jamestown and other communities on the eastern half of North America, they're experiencing the same mini ice age, the same period of drought that affected the Mississippians is what's affecting Europeans when they first come here. So how do we actually fight environmental change? Well, today we use science. Science tells us what the world is doing, and it also offers us clues as to how to change that. But the ancient Mississippians had religion. So in their minds, religion and reality were the same thing. They actually changed the shape of the world based off what their deities and how they interacted with the world, similar to what we do with science. So Spyro is a site, a location in which the Mississippian people came here with the attempt to restart the environment and actually reverse the effects of climate change. So all of the objects you see in this space are dedicated to that change. So the easiest way to think about this is to look at Judaism, Islam, Christianity, the story of Genesis. It's a very familiar topic. So what they did is we know what God did on day one, day two, day three. Here we know the exact same thing. Indigenous communities know how the world was made. And they believed if you could recreate this, you can actually recreate the world. And so all of the objects in this space were part of that recreation. And it begins with these two pieces right here. These are amazing pieces. These are works of art that would have been prized in any community anywhere in the world. And they begin with this plank clay statue here. This is Morning Star, and he is the god of war. And as uh, in contemporary Pawnee, uh, traditions, he came to the earth as a meteor and brought the world fire. Next to him is Earth Mother. Earth Mother is responsible for rebirth and regeneration, but she's also associated with corn. 
And corn is critical to the advancements of these large ceremonial centers um, because it, wasn't, it, it allowed them a stable food source. So these pieces are actually critical. And these were found at Spiro in a single context. So what we find at Spiro never happened anywhere else in that we have the creation of a hollow chamber. And this hollow chamber set on top of what we call Craig Mound, and all of the items in this room, minus the contemporary pieces, were put inside this hollow chamber in a particular way. So the Earth Mother piece was set in the middle of the room. The Morning Star piece was actually put into the wall of the chamber. There were baskets with outfits in them, and there were engraved shells set up on the side of the room. And what we have in the far corner is a map which shows how this room was laid out. Now, all the pieces you're gonna see in this room are actually gonna be seen in a map that is just behind me. So let's walk over here real quick. So this is a map or a painting of the trilayered universe. It shows the above, the middle, and the below world. Now, this same ideology or religious system is not only in North America, but it goes all the way into Central America and is very similar to the Maya world. And that shows the underworld as a night sky, and it has Earth Mother. And then it flips. But you see the world right here, the real world, and above it, you have the Tree of Life, as well as the hand motif, which is the entrance to the Milky Way and Morning Star. Most of the things you're gonna see in this picture come from the actual objects that were made by the Mississippian people and put into the Spiro Hollow Chamber. And we will zoom in on some of those here in just a bit. So when you come over here, you're gonna see not just stone, but you're gonna see wood. These pieces here show a combination of wood with shell, as well as copper. Within each of these pieces, you're gonna see distance travel to reach Spiro. Now this is important because the stuff we find at Spiro came from across the known world. For instance, much of the copper we, co we see here comes from the Great Lakes. It comes from Michigan. And so, in order to do this, people would have had to mine the copper in Michigan and then move it down to Oklahoma. The only way I know that this occurred is by walking or in a canoe. So you had to use waterways. So looking at how people move material is very important because this stuff came from all over the known world. This is an example of more copper here. So you can see that it's not limited to any one given form, but it shows this is a falcon. And you can see that it's done in multiple settings. If we walk around here, what we'll see is more copper. And each one of this is different. And we're gonna have copper that looks like a human head with, if you remember, the first case with the long nose maskettes there's an image of a human face wearing those maskettes. Those maskettes are also being worn by the flint clay statue, Morning Star. If you go to his side, you're gonna see him wearing two maskettes. The other is a copper hand. Again, it relates what you saw in the Mississippian world and is identical to the hand you saw on the pieces from Moundville. And this is a great piece. It is a human head. And this is the same head you're going to see on many of the spiral engraved cups. And these cups actually traveled from the Florida Keys. And so they spent about 1,400 miles, or it took about 1,400 miles for them to get here. So we know that this style of um, whelk shell only comes from the Florida Keys or Veracruz. The vast majority come from Florida. So they would have had to have been harvested, 
and then moved across the United States to present-day Oklahoma. Now, this case also highlights one of my favorite aspects of this exhibition, and I think one of the most telling, is that it includes the inclusion of contemporary artwork throughout. So it's about bringing together contemporary artists and contemporary communities and showing that the Mississippian people never stopped being here. They are connected to the modern Caddo and Wichita, as well as Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and a dozen other communities. And so what we did was we had um, the fortunate ability to work with these communities and actually incorporate a lot of their artwork into the space to show you that the traditions that the Spiros, Spiroan and Mississippian people used a thousand years ago is still being used today. And so it's really important that we see this as America's classic culture, one that never disappeared. So this is one of my favorite contemporary pieces. This is by Margaret Roach Wheeler, and she is a Chickasaw artist, and um, she actually got a fellowship to the National Museum of the American Indian, and she studied Spiroan textiles, and there were textiles at Spiro. They would have been bright colors. They would have been yellow, red, green, black, and they would have had beautiful forms woven into them. Well, she studied those and then came home and hand wove this in the same way that the ancient Spiroans were weaving material as well. And so you can see an assortment of those things um, throughout the gallery. You're going to see one piece of Spiroan textile in one of these cases, but you're also going to see baskets. And so most of the things you see in this space um, were housed in baskets. Each of the baskets, and there were 18, um, all had a different design with them. So we highlighted two designs uh, that you can see in this space. You will note that the vinyl surrounding the cases is different in each room. Each room has a different design taken from a Spiroan basket. Each of these baskets contain not only objects, but outfits. And I believe the outfits you're looking at would have been deity outfits, so we call these god boxes. But you're also going to see these images here that look like drawings. They are, because these are WPA drawings. And they highlight the objects that were actually excavated at the site. Now below each, you're going to see a yellow or an orange placard that says, can you find me in the gallery? And every time you see this, know that these pieces actually are somewhere in the space. And I want you to go find them. So you're going to see an assortment, too, of once again highlighting the ancient basket traditions with contemporary basket traditions. This is an image showing the work by Clara Darden, uh, a Chittimaca style or Chittimaca style double wove basket. And each of these has a different design. Designs you will see that never stopped being produced. For instance, look at the common thread here. You get the, for lack of a better word, the S designs, and you're going to see those previously on the basket we just uh, showed you earlier, as well as the vinyl that's on the cases. So, and we have descriptions of textiles and the role they played in Spyro. Here is an actual textile from Spyro. And um, this is very stable, and it's the only one we chose to include because it was so stable. Uh, the others were too fragile to travel, and we just didn't feel good about bringing them in. But you're going to see, once again, the ancient Spyro textile connected to a modern double woven basket. So again, you're going to see the coming together of these two different um, time periods. So it's not just about the ancient materials. There's actually another important element to this, and that is the historic area or the historic era. 
And so you're gonna see black and white photos scattered throughout the spiral room, which showed what the site would have looked like starting in the early 1900s. And this raises an interesting point because how was Spiro identified? So Spiro was first identified in 1917, um, but the people who owned the land refused to allow it to be excavated. However, in the 1930s, a group calling themselves the Pecola Mining Company actually gained access to the site through a lease, and they began to tunnel in and dig up the spiral mounds. Unfortunately, they were not archaeologists, and what they did was they looted the site, and they did that for two years, and they scattered the objects we see in this space throughout the entire world. And so um, it's been a real undertaking to try to actually understand what was found at Spyro and get it back here. So, and to do that, we've actually uh, dedicated an entire room to archeology span and looting. So as you progress through here, you get to see not only the ancient material, but contemporary um, black and white photos. Now, after the excavations occurred, or the looting occurred, um, the University of Oklahoma and the state of Oklahoma got together and they stopped um, allowing people to independently excavate in the state. And so Spyro was taken over by the WPA and the University of Oklahoma. The image you see right here was done by the WPA in 1941, and all of the objects and all of the people you see in this space are connected to objects that you'll find in this room. For instance, the Birdman in the columella shell, as well as the beads, he's seen on an engraved shell cup. You can see the ear spools. These ear spools you can find in a case in the gallery. You also find certain ceremonial weapons here as well. So if you look at that piece and then come over to this case dealing with ceremonial weaponry, you can see the object right here. So everything you're gonna see in this space has a story and it came from a multitude of different locations, but you're gonna see it over and over and over again not only the actual object, but once again, you can stare at the object and then see the WPA image of it in the background. So once again, can you find this piece in the gallery? So um, to tell this story, you know, it's not just about ancient spiral, and that's what makes this exhibition really difficult, was it's such a big story. So in addition to the earlier drawing I told you about earlier, this is what the inside of that hollow chamber would have looked like. You can actually come over here and place the pieces on the map. And so it just kind of gives you a better understanding of how this stuff was used. But once again, to pull it into the contemporary world, um, we have a room dedicated to, eight, uh, to the historic period. And this talks about the looting that occurred at Spyro in 1933, as well as the WPA excavations. This room is gonna actually have a combination of black and white photos, newspaper articles, and video of the actual uh, excavation that occurred in the 1940s. So you can come over here and actually see the objects it, that, were, that are in the exhibition, as well as the pieces that are in the exhibition connected to newspaper articles from the 1930s. If you will remember, there's your morning star pipe. There's the ceremonial maces, and there is the, um, the shell. So, you can actually see the connection between the, the objects you see repeatedly over and over and over again. It's not only the ancient, but it talks about how it moved into the historic period. So um, many of the pieces here too, 
you can see uh, not only ceramics, but in this instance, you see an assortment of beads. Now, what's kind of unique about Spyro is uh, we don't know how many were there, but there were baskets full of river pearls and beads. And these beads, we actually were able to trace to the Sea of Cortez. And so we know that they traveled a great distance to get here. And that's the Gulf of California, all the way east to Spyro. But once again, these cases actually highlight the WPA drawings in the background. But more than that, they also highlight contemporary artwork. So the piece in the back belongs to uh, contemporary Caddo artist Chase Earls, as well as Jerry Redcorn, who has a piece here on the side. Um, and so just once again, really highlighting cultural continuity. It is, um, these are traditions that never stopped being around. They've always been in existence. And so it's important when we start looking at artists today and communities today to acknowledge the fact that they are still here uh, and still part of what makes America so wonderful, its diversity. And that's what makes Spyro so unique too, is Spyro wasn't one particular site. Stuff came from all over the known world to Spyro. That means it was made by people uh, who spoke different languages, had different cultural ideas, and different architecture, but they still shared a common connection. And that brought all these pieces to Spyro. So the cultural continuity, there is a room dedicated to this, and it's called cultural continuation. And this space focuses on today's world. And you're gonna see contemporary artwork. This was done by Joel Queen. And this is a ceramic vessel that is a perfect circle. And you're gonna see a lot of the pieces, a lot of the things that he engraved in this piece from the spider to corn to birds to the hand are seen throughout the space. So there's your spider. Again, it's a piece that's highlighted in the Mississippian Gallery as well as the Spyro Gallery. Behind me, you're gonna see a skateboard. I think no better object speaks to adaption and continuation than this piece because it, it highlights that there are these traditional indigenous ideas and themes and beliefs. At the same time, it's on a skateboard. It's really being brought into the present because like everyone else, you know, it's just kind of, it's all about adaption and moving. Uh, one of my favorite pieces is behind us. This was done by Muskogee artist Star Hartridge. And what's really cool about this is it not only embraces the themes seen throughout the exhibition, but it's done in a very unique way. And this was done through dot painting. So each of these pieces here is not a bead, but an individual acrylic painted dot. So this entire artwork here uh, would, is just exceptional. It would have, I can't even imagine how long it would have taken to complete. Again, highlighting the themes that you're going to see over and over and over again throughout the exhibition. So now you're moving into a space completely dedicated to just uh, contemporary artwork. And so this, this piece is here. You're going to see stuff from the Seminole Nation. You're going to see stuff from the Cherokee Nation, Caddo. Uh, one thing that really stands out in my mind is we have... Um, a painting of Sequoia here. So how many people know about Sequoia, know the story of Sequoia? Well, did you know that Sequoia is a Mississippian? You know, we look at him as Cherokee, and he is, uh, but it kind of should be highlighted that the Cherokee, as well as the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, are descendants of the people who made these large ceremonial centers. So it's really important that you start seeing these connections between past and present, and uh, seeing how they all relate. So in addition to that, you're gonna be looking at, this is a monolithic ax created
created by Wayne Earls, a Caddo artist. If you'll note, when you're in the Spiroan room, you'll see ancient Spiroan axes made just like this. Well, this was made in 2019. But I think of all of the pieces in this room, there is no better piece to me than this by Brenna Nance, a Wichita artist. And this is a picture of her grandbaby in a Wichita cradle. No better piece of work sums up cultural continuation uh, than actually getting to see the next generation. And so it just shows that people are again, once again, are still here and are, you know, still actually creating their culture, building their culture, and actually um, enhancing the larger society we all live in. So anyway, once you leave the, the contemporary, you move into a, a room that I'm extremely proud of, and that is the educational area. And this was, this is one of the best rooms and the best educational suites we've ever done at the museum. And it allows people to actually take a hands-on approach uh, to the exhibition. So in the space, in the spiral room, you're gonna see several touch items. You're gonna be able to touch flint clay. You're gonna be able to touch copper. And in this space, you're gonna be able to sit down and read a book but also do various games, flat weaving, um, as well as basket weaving. You're gonna see the images that you saw throughout the space reproduced. Um, you're gonna see videos here, again, touchscreen videos. And this is really cool because these are concepts about the Mississippian world for children produced by children. And truthfully, they're better than the academic talking heads. So I think they do a really great job of summing up uh, some of the themes that we're gonna see throughout the exhibition. Um, lastly, what you see here is uh, something that I think is just spectacular, and that's the integration of virtual reality. And we're gonna see, you, here's an example of how you can do a star search. So if you will recall, many of the pieces I mentioned before, the hand, Morningstar and others are connected to the uh, night sky and they're connected to constellations. Well, here's an example of how you could actually put on a virtual headset and see these pieces in the night sky. The other one is Explore Spyro. And this was created by the University of Arkansas's Tesseract program, which does game development or video game development. And what they did is they recreated Spyro in a virtual reality. And you would be able to put on the headset and walk into this reality and actually touch and pick up items that you saw in the exhibition. One of them is the Morning Star Pipe. Another one is an engraved shell cup. These engraved shell cups would go back to the first images you saw when you walked in here by Theodore de Bry where they show people drinking out of cups, a drink called a black drink, um, in a ritualistic way. Then you see the cups in the Spyro world, or the Spyro part of the exhibition. Then you come in here, and you can actually hold a cup as well and drink the same drink that they would have drank a thousand years ago. So there is a lot of different levels of how you can actually interact with this exhibition from getting to read about it, to getting to see the objects themselves, to be able to touch objects in the gallery, and in this instance, being able to actually step back in time and live the Spyro uh, ritual. So anyway, I think the exhibition produces a wide range of different learning opportunities. And I think it's important to look at some of the pieces that you see in every room and see the same theme being utilized over and over and over again. The image of the spider, the image of um, morning star, the hands. So you're gonna see the same thing over and over and over again and be able to relate it back to the themes of each room. So 
Thank you very much. I hope that the tour was uh, informative and uh, I look forward to you visiting.